All right, good evening, everyone who is uh, here participating. And thanks, Yana, for an awesome introduction. That is like perfect priming material for what we're going to go into. So I'm kind of excited because um, this is really fun material to go into. So we'll kind of learn some things about the eyes and what we'll learn about why it affects the eyes and how we can use it for so many other illnesses like Chinese medicine often does. So for this presentation, I'm going to break it up into a few sections so we can kind of understand some of the overarching principles that I'm trying to establish and then how, how to use them. So first, we'll just look at some basic deductions about the eyes. And then we'll do a brief introduction into the 12 primary channels as a continuum, which is my favorite. So it's kind of like seeing it like Wending tradition or, you know, Shenhan Lin tradition, just going deeper into the body. And you can use it as a method of diagnosis, which I will say is highly underused by all practitioners when it almost should be a primary one. 12 primaries are great. And then I'm going to break things down and look specifically into the ye, yeah, like the thick fluids that are produced by the small intestine and their major roles in the contribution of eye diseases. And following the same principles towards many other diseases, depending on which organ systems are involved, what and why. And then last to top it off, we're just going to look at the yang meridians as a progression and how they implicate the eyes. Click here. Okay, so here's just a little bit of information just to get the ball rolling and just kind of generate some thinking about the eyes. So the liver is the last of the 12 primary channels, controlling the hun that doesn't want a body. It's the major sense organ pertaining to the eyes is the liver. The eye sockets, are the highest major hole in the skull. The ear sockets are a little bit lower, but the ears do go higher, but the sockets are lower. Um, and every yang meridian goes to the eyes. It has an eye connection. Uh, the, the sense organs are activated by the pure yin fluids. This stuff, we already know. It's like, we've learned this tons of times, but it's manufactured by the stomach, which we call pure yang a lot in our school. And I think just to add in, I don't really think it's, it is and it isn't, but just to add another perspective, it's not really the decline of Jing that's the primary cause of aging, but the fixation of the senses. Because when we narrow our senses, we limit all of our limitless possibilities and just start the aging process because we've narrowed out every possible outcome. And then this is just... I'm not going to touch on this much, but another thing to think about. The liver's job of resolving karma while we sleep are different unfinished scenarios within our blood because we store so many of our emotions in our blood, right? So we go into sleep paralysis, we enter REM sleep, and the moving eyes rapidly to different positions while we're in dream states. And this can help us just using the eyes to resolve different emotional problems that we accumulate throughout the day. While we're laying down, all that blood goes back to our liver and it becomes like the primary blood holder during the nighttime. So an introduction to the 12 primary channels. So here's the, here's the brief part. So we're starting with the lungs. And this WC, the lungs, wind cold. Getting cold right now. So the lungs, wind cold, transform in the large intestine to wind heat. Once the stomach, it becomes internalized, or this, the stomach is the place where things are internally generated, which is also wind heat, deficiency of the jinn. Once we enter the spleen, we enter the beginning of deficiency of qi, the heart pericardium level, we enter the deficiency of blood. Once we get to the small intestine, this is where things get important. And um, I'm going to do a lot of focus on this. And it's the beginning of latency. And if people are unfamiliar with the term latency, it's often called hidden qi or fu qi in um, Chinese. But it's basically when the taxation of the body begins 
and we use yin, we use qi, blood, ye, jin, we use the bodily fluids to hold a pathogen in place. And over time, this taxes the body. So just keeping things in place with our fluids, exhausts our fluids over time. And the small intestine is the beginning of the latency. And the urinary bladder, among some other things, it's going to be displacing a lot of heat. And it's going to be moving a lot of things around. But I'm kind of flip-flopping between the pathological function of the Zongfu organs as well as the physiological healthy functions of the Zongfu organs throughout this. Because uh, it would take even more time to distinctly do them both separately. And the kidneys, the beginning of the Jing deficiency. So as you see, we're kind of moving from thinner to thick. Qi, Jin, you know, like exterior. Jin, Qi, blood, Ye, Jing. It's getting thicker and thicker as we go through the channel system. Once we reach the level of the San Jiao, we now have fire toxins. And by the way, the, I didn't say it, but the pericardium is lumped in classically with the heart as the original heart channel. So that's why they're linked together there. And once we get the gallbladder, we have the loss of functions, like motory sensory issues, and the liver being the last of the end channels of the 12 primaries. This is where we have the death of the cycle. So we're going through life to death. We're going through the decay cycle. We're basically going through the five element backwards, in essence. But the liver, it's kind of the end or the finish. And then you figure, well, did I resolve what I was trying to do? Or do I need to do it again? Or can I kind of move on? So that's a little brief outline of them all. So I made this beautiful tapestry, which I'm going to make bigger. So to get even more in-depth of this channel continuum, 12 channel prime or 12 primary channel continuum from exterior or from start to finish. It's kind of like Shanhan Lun tradition. Winding cold, the causes of a hundred diseases. And philosophically here, I'm going to call wind is synonymous with change. And cold is the inability to move forward. It's slowing down. You can't move forward into those life decisions. So change happens. You don't want to move into it. So if you can't deal with it, it starts on the exterior with the lungs as wind cold. And if you can't shake it off, as the lung channel descends, remember the lung channel is the first channel to descend. So as soon as it hits the large intestine, it gets transformed into heat. So now the cold pulses are going to transform into hot pulses. And with the large intestine channel, the first yang meridian in the sequence is going to start moving upwards towards the head. So again, by the way, this is, um, I'll throw some spiritual parts into. So this is also the, um, the Po. And the Po wants to get inside a body. The Po wants to consolidate. It's the beginning of the whole cycle. So in the lungs and metal have to do with morality, has to do with social issues, guilt, grief, etc. But what I'm trying to say is like, there's a charge in polarity. So as soon as you feel guilty about something, or, or as soon as you have a moral feeling about something, instantly you've created polarity. It's your, your jung chi. It's kind of you made a decision that something is good or bad. And it inherently, as soon as something because becomes good and bad, it enters a state of polarity. It, it separates. So you got to deal with that shit. So it's going into the body. So large intestine moves up, enters the head, still the exterior of the body. And the stomach, the primary channel of the stomach is an ascending channel. It goes up. So the primary channel of the stomach is on the head and face. So it's not actually so descending as we think, but it's trying to get things up and out. And on the head and face, well, until stomach 12, this is all considered the exterior. So lungs, large intestine, stomach, we're still working with the pathogenic factor that is still on the exterior of the body. And in my little picture here of my man, there's kind of like an ode with the point names on the face. So you have stomach five, 
and you have great welcome. So this is saying we're inviting you in. And then you have stomach nine, which is man's welcome. It's basically you're inviting pathogen into the interior or whatever, whatever experience that you're trying to do. Stomach nine, you're in, this is a doorway, like you open or close it. And so stomach nine is where you can let it in. There's, um, there's always so many little odes in the character symbols in the story of this tapestry of the channels. It's beautiful. And stomach 12, the basin. So this is where five out of the six young channels meet, except the urinary bladder. So the urinary bladder is responsible for bringing things out. So it's not in here. All the young channels are meeting at stomach 12. And as you see, this is where the stomach becomes interior. So once you get past the head, you're inside the body. You've entered the way level and you've entered the, the, the yin level. So you've, you've entered the, the level of the yin interior, which is really important. And then the stomach deals with some specific things. So the stomach deals with the environment, epigenetic factors, like Eric was talking about from the exterior. But it's also the beginning of internally generated heat. So these are things that are completely generated inside of you versus outside of you, which begins on the level of the stomach. And this is where the stomach binds, looks at. It binds your, your food, your thoughts, binds your feelings, and it binds your emotions. This is kind of the, the primal beginning of intelligence at this level, where you start looking at things and you give it your focus. And again, now we're entering the level of the earth, and that's the, uh, the yi, the intellect, which I more like to call focus. So the, the yi, the mind, has to do with focus. It's what you're, what you're paying attention to, what you're thinking about, what you're doing at work. So this is constantly being built up, these foods, thoughts, feelings, and emotions, things that come from inside of you, because the stomach deals with internalized external pathogens, as well as internally generated pathogens or internally generated heat. So the beginning of the food, thoughts, feeling, emotions. And what does the spleen do? Um, well, I guess I'm jumping ahead, but just remember the spleen banks the blood. So the spleen is gonna take those thoughts, feeling, emotions, and it's gonna bring it into the blood. It's gonna bank it. So you can use those emotions to do anything. But let's let's move down. So we have the stomach and let's look at the controlling the gin, the thin fluids. So I have these that I'll explain to you. So they, they all go up, essentially. I just have this picture going this way. But the gin fluids also have pure and turbid. So you have the pure fluids, which go to the sensory organs and the pure fluids will kind of be like tears when you have things like sniffles and it'll also help generate saliva. But the gin fluids also have a turbid, which will go to the skin and sinews to generate wei qi. It'll also generate dampness over time, which the body uses as a source of wei qi, but it also obstructs things if it grows too much. So that's part of the gin thin fluids. So once we get to the spleen, so we move from stomach to spleen, banking the thoughts, feeling, emotions, building the intellect, right? So we're building the intellect and the spleen banks it. The spleen banks the emotions. And because the spleen is banking the emotions, the blood, to try to resolve that pathogenic factor by doing things. Like you constantly have to, you constantly try to resolve the pathogenic factor by doing something in your life like going to exercise or making a certain medicine but if you do the same thing to try to fix the pathogenic factor and if you do it over and over again in the same thing with no revol no results you're gonna become deficient of chi and eventually if you can't resolve it with banking the blood you're going to become deficient in blood by doing it over and over and over again. And that's the heart, which is the beginning of the blood deficiency. 
And the heart is what circulates the blood. It's kind of what circulates our purpose in life as, as the Shen. So now we move in to the level of the small intestine. So the small intestine is the beginning of latency. And I, I have this laid out as um, physiological and pathological in what happens. So the ye, yeah, again, just like the jin, can be broken up into pure and turbid, yin and yang. Everything can be constantly broken into yin and yang. So the pure ye yeah fluid of the small intestine goes to nourish the zong fu organs directly. It, it, it supplements the post postnatal jing. The turbid ye yeah ends up going to the bones, the marrow, the spine, and the brain, constantly nourishing these. But when ye yeah gets heat, so by the way, remember, we started with wing cold, transform into wind heat. The stomach internalizes the heat and it gets even hotter. We move to the spleen. We still have the heat. The heart passes the heat to the small intestine, just like the small intestine likes to pass the heat like a football off to the urinary bladder, constantly trying to get rid of the heat. But the ye yeah pathologically holds heat. So the ye, yeah, which so what is ye? Yeah? Ye yeah is a thick, sticky yin fluid. What are yin, thick yin, sticky fluids good for? Perfect for, in fact, for storing heat. It's the absolutely perfect substance for storing and insulating heat. So now your ye, yeah, instead of being used to nourish your kidneys, is now being used to nourish and hold pathogenic heat in the body. So to the urinary bladder, looking at it, ooh, I'm not gonna show you that yet. So the urinary bladder, the yang, brings the jing and the ye to the back shoe points, physiologically. When everything's functioning normally through our digestion, eating, etc., the ye supports the jing constantly re-nourishing our stocks of energy. And, but, we can't support it. Like, the ye yeah can't support the jing anymore if it's used for pathological heat. This is why it's the beginning of latency. Because now to hold the pathogenic factor, you're constantly using your postnatal materials. So they don't get used for wellness things. The urinary bladder is used to displace the heat constantly. And we move into the kidneys. And so the kidney uses the yang energy of the urinary bladder. Because what do, what do the, the, the yang organs of the yin yang pair do? They, they kind of do the, yeah, they do the yang aspect of things. So if you can see this in the progression in the building of energy and chi. So now we're at the willpower. We're transforming raw materials and we're transforming qi into a physical substance. And that's why we're at the jia. That's why we're at the willpower. We're physically turning into something. So the urinary bladder yang is going to take the kidney yin, which is hormones essentially, but of other things. The, the urinary bladder yang is going to take the jing essence. It's going to bring it into the sacrum frame and holes. Up the frame and holes, the urinary bladder is going to take it to the back shoe points. And by the way, historically, the back shoe points used to be extra points of the kidney. It, it, see if you can see it that way as well. But the urinary, urinary bladder yaw is going to take the essence to the back shoe points to be disseminated by the triple heater. And once it enters the back shoe points, the Jing essence is going to go to the Zong Fu organs and then to the triple heater, um, the Yun, Yun prime points. So from the kidney yang, sacral foramen travels up the spine, like the little tree of life, to the Ji, the spine. It's going to go into the back shoe points and it's going to go to the Zong Fu organ to animate your life because you have the willpower 
to take something and solidify it, to consolidate it, to make it real, which needs the help and effort of the Zong Fu organs and a little bit of essence. So triple heater is pathologically the beginning of fire toxins. And the triple heater is the governor between fire and water. So it's kind of like a mediator between fire and fire and water. And there's an ode to this. It's kind of pretty cool. So like if you look at the characters on the San Jiao channel, you'll see that the San Jiao channel has some of, I think the most, um, okay, I'm almost certain it's the most, water radical characters on the points. And as it goes up, they become less and less. And as a matter of fact, that triple heater 16 is the last water radical. And the water radicals transform into heaven radicals. So it goes from water, like Jing, essence, into heaven. And how do you make that transformation process? You do it with fire. So triple heater is in charge of taking water and transforming it with fire to animate your life with, with the Jing, I mean, with the, the Jing essence. And so moving on to gallbladder. So the gallbladder, the triple heater doesn't actually go right to the gallbladder. It actually goes to the young prime points, et cetera, wherever they are. But the uh, next organ in the 12 channel primary is looking at the gallbladder. And the gallbladder is amazing. And I keep learning more and more and more about it. So the gallbladder, it's like, put. do I put it out? Do I bring it back in? Do I put it out? Do I bring it back in? And it, it kind of acts as a link because being a primary channel as well as a curious organ, and when I say curious organ, I mean an extraordinary organ. It, I, I say it by the same name. So it's kind of like a bridge. Like between these, there's, there's kind of two bridges in the six curious organs. But the gallbladder is to bring things out, come back in, bring things out, come back in. This is the timidity and shyness associated or the fear associated with the gallbladder. It's just the commitment to follow through or store it back in the body. So it's kind of in charge of that. And the gallbladder is the link. So how should I say this? So essentially, you have the brain here, the sea of marrow. And this is where, like, like it's pretty cool. So basically, I, I should bring it back to triple heater again. So triple heater, why it's the beginning of fire toxins. Because if you're using your ye, you're using your fluids of your body to hold pathogens in place. Then they can no longer be used to transform. So you, the triple heater goes about its pro process of transforming fire to water. But you have no jing. You have no essence. You have no fluids. So what's the triple heater going to do? It's going to start transforming you. It's going to transform the cells of your muscles. It's going to transform parts of your body into chi. It's going to transform it back because it's trying to get to the, the wood element, the, the hun. It's trying to, the hun doesn't want to be in the body anymore. It wants to transform back to ethereal. And that's what the triple, triple burner does. Takes jing, transforms it back to an ethereal state, a, a hun state. And if your body has no jing to transform, it's going to transform you because your body is an essence yin. And that's, that's why the triple heater at this stage is creating fire toxins within the body. So the gallbladder go out, go back in. And as part of, um, extensively with the, like the yin wei mai and, um, yang chao mai. So, oh, should I put it here? Yeah. I like, I'm just digesting this other material now, but I think it's relevant enough. And I think I can, I can do it. So, Jing plus Shen equals Shui, marrow. And what is marrow? Marrow is essentially moving Jing. So the gallbladder, the eyes, is an eight extraordinary organ, or a six curious organ, 
goes to the sea of marrow. Gallbladder 39 controls the marrow. So if you think of marrow like Jing plus Shen, Jing plus Shen equals marrow. It's like the ledger of your experiences. And you think of Shui, or you think of Shui, marrow, like moving Jing. So now your Jing can move. And you know, so you have the brain, which is connected with the spine. And the spine, if you took your medulla oblongata and your cerebellum out of your brain stem, your brain stem essentially extends all the way down your back, all the way down all your back shoe points. And you have cranial sacral marrow moving jing that goes up and down your spine. So the gallbladder as being in charge of the brain, the gallbladder being in charge of the marrow is going to take that moving jing and it's going to dissipate it along your spine so you can do sensory shit with it. Uh, really amazing, right? Um, yeah, so jing plus shen combines to make marrow. Marrow is moving jing. It can move up and down your spine. Because you have marrow in the bones, it doesn't move so much. But you have marrow in the brain and the spine. And each night you go into your REM sleep and that marrow goes up and down your spine, recycles all the stuff it doesn't want in your brain and doesn't want out of your brain. Gallbladder is the master of so many of these functions. Because it's in control. It's not in control, but being right here and being so connected to the sea of marrow and the gallbladder being the link Arguably, also the vessels can be can be a link to these organs, but I see a primary as a link between the six curious organs. So anytime you want to work with the six curious organs, gallbladder is your man. He's super helpful. So when that gets disrupted, especially from the toxic heat of the triple triple burner, you start to have motor sensory input because eventually, eventually, the heat will get displaced into the six curious organs because if you have no yet left no jing left it's going to store it in your bones it's going to store it in your brain it's going to bring it to your marrow it's going to bring it to your vessels go to the uterus and when you get to the liver this this signifies the death so or the new life because with death comes new life are you like have you resolved the issue you're trying to do do you reincarnate or do you incarnate so this is my tapestry. Um, I'm really happy with it. And I'm gonna keep building on because there's so many little aspects that I didn't add in because uh, I didn't think I'd have enough time. But, um, oh yeah, I didn't say, but like, uh, yeah, the triple heater disseminates the dong chi or the moving key of the chi, moving chi of the kidneys. Oh, that's good stuff. All right. I might be needing you again. So, moving on. So, we're dealing with yeah, right? Yeah holds pathogenic heat, eventually. Part of the small intestine. And looking at blood plaque, which the heart governs the vessels, which is the small intestine's yin-yang pair. That may be important. So I want to look at everything as plaque in the blood, as a mechanism to cool down the body and the blood, containing heat. Plaque has an alkalizing effect on the blood. Plaque cools it off. The primary ingredients in blood plaque is deposits of fatty substances, cholesterol, cellular waste, calcium, and fibrin. Fat Fat-like, very yin-like, alkalizing, and fiber fibrin can also hold heat and bind together because you need something, you need a binding agent in this whole mess going on. So calcium is an alkali and any alkali substances, it neutralizes excess acid. Acid generates heat on the scale of things. When your ye and your small intestine is working functionally, the ye supports the kidney jing. When the ye becomes pathological and starts to store heat, the body can create blood plaque with its postnatal resources. So you're using all this stuff, the fat, the cholesterol, the cellular waste, the calcium, fibrin, all these things that you could use to nourish your body 
or recycling it out of your body, you're using pathologically to hold heat. Yeah, holding it. So, what's going on here? So, when the yeah, let's see. When the yak can no longer support the jing postnatally, it has to use its own resources to alkalize the blood. It can borrow, so it has to borrow calcium from the bone, the kidneys. So when the yak can't support the kidneys and the yak can't support the system anymore, you got to borrow calcium from the bone. You have to borrow it from the, the jing, the kidneys. And this is the level where you start getting to osteoporosis. You see bone deterioration. You see the loss of physical structure in different types of diseases because the body is stealing calcium from the bone to cool off and alkalize the body. Eventually, the bones from the kidneys or a part of the body needs the calcium back. You got trauma, you got hit, whatever you do, and you started running for, if you were young for some reason and your bone needs some density, who knows? Like, the possibilities are limitless. And so now, if the body needs the calcium back, the calcium that's been, been supporting the blood temperature by alkalizing the blood, it now returns back to the bone. So in this process, once it supports holding the pathogenic factor and the body's deficient and needs it back, it'll follow the pathogenic factor will follow the bone back into the level of the bone. So once you get to this state, all the jing is depleted, heat, you're, you're storing heat with the jing, with the bone, with the calcium, it'll bring that pathogenic factor back to the bone, to some of the deepest parts of your body. Like it's your, it's your core of your body. It's where all your like white blood cells and red blood cells are made. So you're deeply, deeply affected at this point because your pathogenic is in your motherfucking bones, which... And good, because now it controls part of your, what creates your own future. So drug, so this is cool with like, um, with Gigi's presentation and the hot flashes and why calcium channel blockers don't help hot flashes. Because drugs like calcium channel blockers, they stop plaque. They get rid of the plaque from the bloodstream. And that's what's cooling off the vessels. That's what's cooling off the heart. And what you're doing with can like um, calcium channel blockers, you're forcing the calcium to return back to the bone because it needs to go back to find its own home. So basically, you're, you're, when you do the calcium channel blockers, you're putting the heat back into the vessels, back into the body, increasing the pathological heat to take some stress off the heart. But you're also bringing the pathogen into the level of the bone, which uh, sucks, but Maybe it's better. Maybe your life could be better that way. It's a, it's a philosophical decision or a personal decision at this point. But if you use the calcium channel blockers and you turn the heat back into the blood, you're going to get the heat signs. They're all going to return. All those things that you got rid of with the blood plaque that it was suppressing by alkalizing the blood are going to return. So this action will begin to increase the circulated heat within the body causing any of the disease patterns of excess heat. So emotional diseases could return. Yin diseases could return. Toxic heat scenarios could return. And you're going to store heat deeper in the body, which subsequently kind of makes it more difficult to get rid of if you try to kick the bucket with it later. So the formation of plaque that is holding latent pathogenic heat can cause the eyes can cause diseases in the eyes or any other region of the body because we know blood plaque hypertension thickened arteries full of junk can cause blockages or stagnation and because it's storing heat it's pathologically storing heat still and we know that the blockages or the stagnation in the vessels the blood capillaries etc can lead to deficiencies so you can have both things going on this we already inherently know so the formation of plaque means that we're using already using resources from the body to hold heat. This means we're already in a state of deficiency at this point. Spleen, the beginning of deficiency of chi. Heart, the beginning of deficiency of blood. Small intestine, things are the beginning to hold pathogenic heat with yeah, 
And once we get to the kidneys, we're becoming deficient in yin. And we're deficient in all these now. So any holding of the heat causes diseases of latency, meaning the slow taxation of qi and blood. In this case, we're looking at the ye, but also the jing. The, 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 the uh, jin fluids could also be involved. Taxation, the taxation of qi, blood, ye, jing is required to hold any pattern. Any pattern. Patholog so in the pathological process, the taxation keeps the pathological process in an asymptomatic state without actually resolving it. Because sometimes we just like to hold in bad shit and not let go of it. But it costs. It costs our qi, blood, jing, yeah, etc. To hold it in, causing heat, which burns off our resources even more. Just because we don't actually want to let go of something which could be inherently harming us. And um, it's worth my own research. I started to look at the Western medicine of uh, the yeah and the blood plaque, which is pretty interesting. And you'll be able to draw many of your own conclusions from it. So, did I have this one first? Oh, yeah. So, anyways, the environments. So, just so you guys know, the stomach is an acidic environment. The small intestine is an alkaline environment. The most acidic at the gate, or the jejunum, ah, brain's fog, but slightly more acidic as the stomach enters into the small intestine, but becomes more and more alkaline as it goes to the small intestine. So the stomach is acidic. Stomach fire is stomach acid. The stomach needs heat and acid to break down protein. The protein is initially broken down in the stomach. It's very important. So eating meats, legumes, etc. Fire, needs stomach fire mm, in the stomach to break it down. The stomach breaks down the proteins to make the amino acids. We know that amino acids are the building blocks of life and they find their home in the blood. Eating proteins, the more proteins you eat will generate stomach fire because it requires heat and acid to break it down. People who have excess stomach fire love to eat fatty gross foods, fast foods, because it dampens the whole effect of the stomach fire. Cools it off just for a little bit. You get that quick fix, temporary relief from the fatty foods, but eventually it comes back raging because once the damp heat dissipates, it makes more heat, you have even more stomach fire. So stomach fires are friend, but it can get raging for various different reasons. Small intestine is an alkaline environment. The small intestine has a much higher pH than the stomach. The small intestine is primarily responsible for digesting carbohydrates and fats. Stomach proteins. The carbs are broken down in the glutose and fructose. The fats are broken down in the triglycerides, which are fat. They combine with cholesterol, fat-like, phospholipids, fat, protein, and they form these things called chylomicrons. Um, and these chylomicrons contain three fatty, sticky, yinny substances. So, you know, they're perfect. They're absolutely perfect, plus a protein. So these are the absolute perfect material for holding any kind of pathogenic heat. Fatty yin stuff put together by the small intestine, part of the yeah. The glucose and fructose can enter directly into the lining of the small intestine right away. And then it can enter quickly into the blood capillaries. So from sugar, you get immediate instant energy, pretty much. But the fatty acids in the small intestine, they get taken up by the cells of the lining of the small intestine and they repack them into that chylomicron which holds all the fats together with one part protein. And it gets repackaged into this circular shape, like a, like a little egg thing. And that thing is too big to diffuse and go directly into the blood capillaries from the endothelial or the cells from the small intestine. So this chylomicron gets transported to the lymphatic vessels near the small intestine. Hmm. You know, <laughs> lymphatic vessels. So you know, the beginning of storing things near the small intestine. 
And these lymphatic vessels near the small intestine, because of this purpose, have a special name called lacteals. And in these lacteals, it's possible for larger substances, like the chylomicrons, to be transported through the lymph system into the blood capillaries to be transported throughout the body. So the lymphatic system from the small intestine acts as an intermediary for things that didn't originally come from the blood to put it into the blood. So immune responses, anything has to come through the small intestine, has to go through the lymph, well, except for like chi food, but like proteins and, I mean, fats and, um, fats and, well, fats, anything that's too big has to go, anything that can hold pathogenic factors really well has to go through the lymphatic system, which is really fascinating, which you can draw a lot of conclusions from that alone. Um, is there anything else I want to add in here? No, I'm loving it. So this is good. So we got a lot of ideas. Just how plaque can hold pathological heat. And once you have latency in the small intestine, because the yeah is not supporting the jing, then you can get bone issues. And if you don't have any jing anymore, your triple heater can't transform your jing. It starts going to burning things. Things are going to turn into pathological heat. This is why the San Jiao is in charge of fire toxins. And yeah, I'll talk about it. Ah, I'll add it now. So just for, so again, for fire toxins, everybody. So fire toxins aren't actually heat. Oh, I'll get into it later. We'll get into that later. So we went through the uptake pathway in Western medicine for um, chylomicrons. So now I want to look at the yang meridians and how they go to an eye, the eyes in a progression. So we can see how it goes deeper and deeper through the progression and use the same thinking that we've been using from the 12 channels as a continuum to see how symptoms and signs progress. Like Wen Bing, but I think 12 channels is way more badass, like way more in depth for cultivating ideas about the body. So beginning with the first yang primary channel, the large intestine. This is where an external factor, because large intestine is still external, and the person can have heat, red, painful eyes. The eyes can get irritated by wind, whatever, and the person starts rubbing their eyes. And rubbing the eyes, the large intestine regulates the fluids, and it starts to get tears to come from rubbing the eyes. So you rub the eyes to kind of get some temporary relief, makes a little bit of fluid, but your, eye, your eyes get um, more inflamed. So some of the diseases from the external, we can be looking at like allergies or kind of like externally produced conjunctivitis. So like pink eye. So things you can get from some other people. The next yang meridian that goes to the eyes, we have the stomach. So the stomach can be an internalized exterior pathogenic factor, or it can be an internally generated pathogenic factor all by itself, because it's the beginning of internalized, internally generated diseases. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so it can come from the large intestine, make its way into the stomach because it's from the exterior, or be internally generated. Because again, internally generated can be the food, the feelings, the thoughts, and the emotions. Because they all begin inside at the stomach before the spleen banks them in the blood, gives them to the heart. So let's say the person eats hot and spicy Chinese food. Tastes yum yum, tastes really good, but the heat has now affected the eyes. They get bloodshot eyes. So at the stomach, the heat gets even worse. So light and photosynthesis feels even more hot. So people start to wear sunglasses to protect their eyes from the heat. Um, so at the stomach, you generally see the same symptomology at the level of the small intestine, except for the heat has become more intense. We also see things like conjunctivitis or anything that came from the small intestine from the exterior, or sorry, from the large intestine from the exterior. Anything can be brought into the level of 
the stomach from the exterior. And people can get like, like pink eye again. But again, they can somatize an illness. Because sometimes people take on an illness to be helpless or something. So people can pay attention to them. And this is the way, like the stomach's in charge of this. Because it's in charge of the, the beginning of those primal emotions. So you can somatize an illness to get reactions from others. And the stomach will do the somatization for things like pink eye. Do you know? Because, you know, you're doing all this hard work and people aren't helping you. So you develop an illness and all of a sudden people start paying attention to you now. So it's kind of achieving the deficiency that you have of an emotion or um, care from others, looking at it emotionally. And after we're still internal. So after moving from the stomach, we move on to the small intestine, which we learned a lot of stuff about already. So again, from the small intestine, it's not from the external anymore, but it's all from internal issues because the eyes are beginning to hold on to heat. The eyes can't resolve the heat, so it stays there as latency. So your eyes are trapping heat and holding it on. The eyes hold heat asymptomatically, which just means latency, and the dampness can be holding heat also. So your lacrimal ducts, your tear ducts, they can begin to get obstructed. The blood capillaries in your eyes will begin to get obstructed. You can have chronic tearing or you can have obstruction in the eyes. Obstruction in the eyes can become the beginning of glaucoma. So you see the pressure building. Just like you have those two different, the wet and dry scenarios can come from either of these um, issues. So the small intestine, which is responsible for the yet, and remember, the yes is supporting the jing. Not enough of this essence, this form, is going to build and help the eyes. It's not, it's like it's like it doesn't have enough moisture on the eyes to capture the image. Like processing a film on a roll of film. There's not enough moisture now because of heat or blockages bringing in fluid or blood. So the eyes become blurry. We begin to see things like floaters. The beginning of things like glaucoma. The urinary bladder, the next channel from small intestine, the urinary bladder. Once we get to this stage, the jing is further affected. Decline in the jing. So we see a decline in the eyes because we don't have enough jing to nourish the eyes. Not enough jing to nourish the eyes. We start to see flan and film go over our eyes like cataracts. We see the beginning of degeneration because jing builds things. Through the whole cycle, Jing is the thing that gives things physical form. So without Jing, we see the beginning of macular degeneration. We need to remember, because it's cool. Loss of yin is the loss of physical representation. You lose yin, you lose a physical representation of it in your body. Deficient yin is equal to macular degeneration, because yin is what gives structure. It's what gives form. So if we're out of jing, we can't give form, things just start rotting away. They just, especially with the toxic heat, once the, uh, the toxic heat comes in. Toxic heat will, um, we'll leave it, we'll, we'll get to that because it's coming up right here. So the San Zhao, where we have the toxic heat, the pressure is now so strong from the blockages in deficiency that we have things like if from blockage and deficiency, we got glaucoma, we got cataracts, we got degeneration, and we got toxic swellings. So what are fire toxins? I just kind of, this just finally figured out in my brain, finally. So fire toxins are like cirrhosis, fibrosis, scarring, and necrosis. So fire toxins isn't heat, although it can generate heat. So fire... Oh, yeah, so fire toxins, it's like if you have a house and a fire blew through the house, but the house is still standing and all the walls of the house are covered in charcoal, charcoal, they're covered in rot and the fire has gone. The house isn't hot anymore, but you have all this burnt stuff. So like your cells, your structure, your form in your body is being all burnt away. So 
it's not generating heat, but it, but it actually can because the dryness, the stagnation can start to generate its own heat. But that still doesn't mean you haven't resolved the source of the heat in the first place that started the fire. You just have all this burnt shit that you got to deal with still. So that's what fire toxins are. The cirrhosis, scarring, fibrosis, and necrosis. And you got to get rid of that. You got to flush that out. And we see the burning of the structure of our cells, our organs, our shape. Because the heat's caused from another source. Next organ. Moving on to the gallbladder. So we have the fire toxins. We have the loss of jing. We have loss of ye, blood, qi, supporting the postnatal factors. So when we look at like the gallbladder controlling sensory function, because remember, it's the sea of the marrow. The gallbladder, GB39, the marrow point. What is marrow? What is shui? Sh shui. So shui, jing, plus shen, equals shui, marrow. Marrow is moving jing. The brain, gallbladder has that connection, the link between the six curious organs, extraordinary organs, by being a primary meridian and a curious organ. So it's the bridge that bridges these things. So the gallbladder has a relation to the, the G, the spine, the brain, the marrow, the bones, the sinews, etc. We essentially see the gallbladder's relationship with the central nervous system. And the spine with your cranial sacral fluid, that moving jing, the marrow, going up and down the spine, in that little microcosmic orbit we like to talk about. And so at the gallbladder, we're no longer able to sensitize ourselves to the images. We can't match the, the brain signals, the sensations that we're feeling from the external world to what's happening in the internal world and vice versa. So there's basically a close off between the external world and the internal world. And they're running on different narratives now and they, they, they can't bridge and touch each other. So when that happens, when you're, you can't match motor functions or sensations to what you're feeling and sensing inside, you begin to have the gaps in your vision. You begin to have blind spots, dark spots begin to form. We start to have the film where we see gaps in our eyes because we can't match the sensory information up with what we're thinking and feeling, etc. So it happens first and at night, then we come blind. And at gallbladder, we think, they see things like retina detachment because the person can't physically hold the eyes anymore. So the retina becomes detached. There's so much loss of all the jing essence and the fire, the blockages, the toxic swellings, that it, it can't supplement anything anymore. And it's kind of like the action of the liver now where it just dies. It's dead. Dead. Um, yeah. So we went through the, um, we just went through the six young organs and how they can be put put together in a sequence involving the eyes and how they build in pathology. We went through the small intestine and its project, production of ye and how calcium and the ye can alkalize the blood to remove acidity from the blood, to remove heat from the blood. But it's not actually removing it, it's just holding it and trapping it in, in the, the cholesterol bindings, etc. So, and now just some other notes that I have for the presentation. So, childhood infectious diseases or pestilent qi can cause severe issues. So they can jump right from the stomach mechanism by damaging the fluids or blood to the San Jiao because it damages the fluid so much, which can create the toxic heat. Once you have the toxic heat, you can cause loss of sight and the blindness. So pestilent pestilent factors and childhood infectious diseases can cause instant blindness right away. It has that much power. The pestilential factors are, are fighting intensely to try to enter your jing and your DNA. Because if you don't have enough fluids, blood, the jing to support the triple heater mechanism, or if your, your jing gets recalled back to the level of the bone, all those pestilential factors are going to find their way into the bone. And they'll get your DNA there. But they'll also get in your cells and different different layers and levels. They're quite the thing. So just the difference between the um, the stomach and the sanjiao when you're looking at things. 
So when you're using the 12 primary channels in that order, so when you're using the stomach, you still have fluids to help the pathogenic factor. And when you're using the San Jiao, the fluid's all gone. You have fire toxins. So you need to borrow the fluid from other places, like, like the Ren channel, Chong channel, just something, some other place that generates fluid at the San Jiao. But when you're still in the stomach stage, there's still fluids. So you can, you know, use the fluid of the stomach to help get rid of the pathogen. Um, so I told the story of the San Jiao channel. Again, how it transforms water into chi, into heaven. And it narrates that by the characters of the water symbols and how it transforms into heaven as it goes up. Um, and also wanted to talk about, so kind of like foods like soluble fiber absorb cholesterol. So we can see that as a pathway to remove pathogenic heat from the ye and the small intestine. So if you, you need that bulk in your stool. You can't have these crunched up turds. You need that fat thing that can absorb heat. Because that's your, one of your, other than the bladder, peeing it away. But like a primary exit for the ye is going to be the poo it out. And the soluble fiber is going to hold, the more sticky it is, the better too. It's going to hold that pathogenic heat so you can get rid of it out which the way it came but that's only if the person's ready to actually let go of it. Because until a person's actually ready to let go of what they're holding on to or change the pattern of what's contributing to the heat, they'll just keep holding on and won't really change. It'll just accumulate again. Oh, look at that. A little, little skill. Um, so that's the end. I, I had so much fun. This is so much of my um, work and material going into this. Um, but it, I'm really happy with it. They're the 12 primary channels as a continuum are absolutely amazing and worth steady to anybody who loves Chinese medicine because, you know, we, we learn so much about them, but we're so isolated into a Zong Fu approach that we don't actually learn and take time or are taught the, uh, the, uh, progressional theory of them and how we can use them as a tool to diagnose and learn shitloads from. So that's the end of this segment. Thanks for watching.